Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Zainab Bora. I have done my MBBS and MD Radiology from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. I am bringing to you this YouTube video focusing on multiple pathological skull X-rays. So we'll be looking at a series of X-rays which have frequently been asked in your PG entrances and trying to understand uh, the appearances and their name signs. Alright, so let's go for it. So beginning with our first X-ray. Uh, also remember most of the skull x-rays that you will be seeing in your exams will be these lateral skull x-rays so as you can see it's been taken in a lateral projection all right so remember these are all lateral skull x-rays that are most frequently asked to us so uh, we have to make out the pathologies from each of these all right so quickly uh, answer in the comment section what you think is the pathology that is being shown in this particular x-ray right here so while you guys are typing, I'll quickly show you what are the pathologies. Alright, so look at all of these tiny black lesions that we can see which are all of variable shapes. Correct? So there are multifocal lytic lesions. Whenever we say the term lytic in radiology, we say something which has been uh, destroying the bone. Alright, so something where the bone is eaten up. It is lysed. Alright, so a normal bone because of the calcium will appear white on the radiology, on the radiographs, alright. But because it is eaten up, those areas which are lysed will no longer appear white. That is, they'll appear as lytic lucent spots. Alright, so these are what we are seeing in this x-ray. Innumerable tiny lytic lesions. Alright, so whenever we see multiple well-defined lytic lesions, the term that is used to describe it has been called been called just a second yes it's been called the raindrop skull or the punched out lytic lesions all right so this is the eponymous term that you need to remember the raindrop appearance or punched out lytic lesion all right so it looks like there have been various punches which have been made in the skull bone all right so this is seen in two conditions you have to remember two conditions which can give a similar looking appearance one is multiple myeloma one is multiple myeloma, a multi-system disease, all right, where multifocal bony lesions will be uh, seen, multiple uh, lytic lesions throughout the skull, throughout the spine, throughout the mandible, you will see these lytic lesions, all right. And the other differential would be a diffuse lytic metastatic pathology, all right. So lytic metastasis throughout the body can also produce such an appearance, all right. One of the feature guys that will help you in the skull x-ray itself is if you see lytic lesions in the mandible, alright, that favors the diagnosis of multiple myeloma. So remember two M's and one more M, alright. So remember multiple myeloma, uh, when you see mandibular lytic lesions, also although we can't see it on this particular x-ray, it's been cut out, but otherwise always look out for this bone and this is important for a theoretical purpose also, alright. So remember two differentials of a raindrop skull or punched out lytic lesions in the bone two differentials mm lytic metastasis all right so now let's look at the next pathology that we have okay so uh, quickly type in your answers what you think we are seeing in this particular x-ray yes so again can you all see very very tiny tiny black dots so we are seeing multiple very very tiny black dots it is much much smaller than the one that we saw for multiple myeloma and lytic metastasis correct so very very tiny black and white dots has been referred to as salt and pepper appearance all right so you have this multiple tiny tiny white dots multiple tiny tiny black dots all right hence the term salt and pepper skull and where is this appearance seen this has been seen in hyperparathyroidism all right this is associated with hyperparathyroidism what is the action of the parathormone guys it will lead to an increase in calcium by doing what to the bone? It causes bony resorption. So it causes multifocal bony resorption in all the bones throughout the body. And skull is one of them. Alright, so remember because of this bony resorption which occurs in the trabeculae of the bone, this trabecular bony resorption gives it the uh, name which is the salt and pepper skull. 
All right. So with that background of salt and pepper skull, let's very very quickly consolidate all the appearances of hyperparathyroidism. Before that, we need to understand the difference, very very important difference between primary hyperparathyroidism and secondary hyperparathyroidism. So let's uh, quickly go through this table. So first is the etiology. So the most basic difference will be the cause. So a parathyroid adenoma is the most common cause of a primary hyperparathyroidism whereas a CKD, a chronic kidney disease gives rise to secondary HPT hence the other name of secondary HPT will be a renal osteodystrophy alright renal osteodystrophy also referred to as secondary hyperparathyroidism then the most important difference that we will notice on an x-ray will be the diffuse bony density. Alright, so remember there will be a diffusely low bony density that is there will be osteopenia when we will see primary hyperparathyroidism. Whereas there would be a background of osteopenia but along with that there will be areas of sclerosis. Alright, remember sclerosis, osteopenia, two opposite terms. Osteopenia means bone density being low. Whereas osteosclerosis means bone density being high, alright, bone appearing whiter than usual. So secondary HPT we will have sclerosis in addition to the generalized lysis also, alright. So a pattern of mixed lysis and sclerosis will be associated, that is osteopenia and osteosclerosis will be associated in secondary hyperparathyroidism. Then we talk about the brown tumours. So remember here there is a catch. Okay, so remember brown tumors in primary HPT are more common if just a simple statement is given more common here. So can I say there is a higher incidence of brown tumors in primary HPT? Yes, but now the catch is that because CKD patients, secondary HPT patients are so much more commoner in prevalence that if they ask you which has a higher prevalence in total if I see how many brown tumors are seen it will be more in secondary HPT just because of the prevalence of the disease being much much higher than primary HPT. Alright, so remember for a general MCQ purpose if they ask you most commonly associated with which answer will be primary hyperparathyroidism. Alright, then we go on to soft tissue calcification or ligamentous calcification. Here again very important, remember chondrocalcinosis more common, more highly seen or more higher seen in primary HPT. Alright, so remember CP cannot place chondrocalcinosis a feature of primary HPT. Alright, whereas the other two types of calcification that is the soft tissue calcification and vascular calcification that will be more common with secondary hyperparathyroidism. Alright, so just remember this difference very very um, clearly. Secondary HPT, more sclerosis. Brown tumors, more with primary. CP, chondrocalcinosis primary, whereas soft tissue and vascular calcification, more common with secondary hyperparathyroidism. Alright, so with that background, let's look at a few images. Let's look at a few images. So, what do we see here? This is one of the most important x-rays that will be given to you when the examiner is pointing you towards hyperparathyroidism. Alright, what do we have to look out for? See, compare the bones, write in the comments what is the thing that you are all able to see here. Very, very important for your PG entrances. What you can see here is that on the radial aspect, can I say that this is the thumb? So on the radial aspect, what I am seeing in the phalanges, Alright, what I am seeing in the phalanges is that the bone is eaten up. The bone is eaten up more on the radial side. Can you all see this? That the resorption is much much more on this side. Much more on this side. Then we compare it to the ulnar side. Alright, so remember this radial resorption of the bone. Alright, this radial resorption of the bone which is seen in the phalanges. Alright, which is seen in the phalanges most commonly in the second and third phalanx. Alright, in the second and third digits basically is a hallmark of hyperparathyroidism. And this is what kind of resorption? This is a subperiosteal type of resorption. Alright, so remember subperiosteal resorption of the hand, hand x-ray like this, a hallmark pathognomic feature of hyperparathyroidism. Alright, very very important. Okay, so with this we look at some more images. What do we see here? What do we see in this x-ray? 
what we are seeing in the spine x-ray is if I take a look at this vertebra that there is this loss of density in the center part and then there is this end plate sclerosis. There is end plate sclerosis that I can appreciate. Alright, this basically gives rise to this alternating band of white and black, white and black, alright, which resembles the jersey of a rugby player. Hence the name rugger jersey spine. Alright, hence the name rugger jersey spine. Now, where did we see that osteosclerosis was more common? Was it primary HPT? Was it secondary HPT? So, yes, it was secondary HPT. So, remember this rugger jersey spine is a feature of renal osteodystrophy or secondary hyperparathyroidism. Alright, very, very important. The other feature that we can appreciate, can you all see this? What is this vessel which just runs anterior to the vertebral body? It is an aorta. Alright, again one more feature from the table comes to mind. Do you remember vascular calcification? Can you see this vascular calcification? Again, it gets accelerated in secondary HPT. So again, in this x-ray itself, I am seeing that vascular calcification is noted here. Along with vascular calcification, we also had soft tissue calcification which was more common here. Alright, in contrast, what type of calcification was more common in primary HPT? It was chondrocalcinosis. What do we mean by the word chondrocalcinosis? The calcification of cartilage. Alright. And very very importantly, two cartilages you have to look at when we are talking about chondrocalcinosis. One is the menisci. Alright. Whenever you are given a knee radiograph and you are seeing such a calcification in the joint space, this is the meniscal calcification. This is the meniscal calcification. Apart from that, they can also give you a wrist x-ray where they are showing the cart cartilage which is the triangular fibrocartilaginous complex TFCC calcification. Alright, so look out for this ligament on the wrist x-ray whereas menisci on the knee x-ray. Alright, this depicts chondrocalcinosis and this is a feature which is more common in primary hyperparathyroidism. Very, very important. In addition, also the similar feature of chondrocalcinosis also seen in a condition which is called pseudogout, which is nothing but your CPPD deposition, which is calcium pyrophosphate deposition. Similar finding, exact same finding of meniscal and TFCC calcification will be associated in pseudogout. Alright, when you do a synovial aspiration here, you will see rhomboidal crystals, which are what? Which are positively biofringent. In contrast to your true gout or your gout, where you have needle shaped crystals, which are negatively biofringent. Alright, so coming back to our skull x-rays, let's now look at the next x-ray. Alright, so while you guys see this x-ray and uh, type in the answers, I will quickly describe the findings for you. What we can see here is, there are these two lesions that I am seeing in the x-ray which are quite well defined. So, I call them as geographic lytic lesions. Again, the bone is eaten up. So, we call it a lytic lesion and it's very well defined. We call it geographical lytic lesion. Correct? Apart from this, what is the other feature? Can you all see the dual margin here? So this is one margin, this is the other margin. So basically, our skull has two tables, correct? There is the outer table, there is the inner table. So when there is a difference, when there is a difference in the lysis of the two tables, it gives rise to two margins. It gives rise to these two margins, alright? So this has been referred to as what? This has been referred to as a bewelled lesion. Alright, this double margin that you can see here has been referred to as a bewelled lesion or we can call them as geographic lytic lesion. Whenever such a terminology is being referred to, what is the disease that we are talking about? We are talking about eosinophilic granuloma or a multisystemic form of the same disease which is Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Alright, very very important. So these multifocal lytic lesions that we will be seeing, not just in the skull, multiple sites these lytic lesions can be seen like the pelvic bone. Alright, so multifocal uh, lytic lesions on the skull they give rise to this bevelled appearance. Typical of LCH, if multiple systems are involved, if solitary involvement, we call it eosinophilic granuloma. Alright, so this is very, very important and the typical history of a child will be given. Alright, most commonly this presence in children. 
all right then let's look at the next x-ray quickly type in your answers what do you think is being shown what is the sign that we uh, call this particular x-ray so what are we seeing here we are seeing this multifocal swirl like gyriform calcification can i say this looks like the gyri of the brain so this is the typical gyriform calcification which has been likened to the tram track appearance all right so this is the tram track skull and this is typically associated with our neurocutaneous syndrome which is the sturge weber syndrome very very important so remember sturge weber syndrome gives rise to this tram track skull and what is the pathophysiology so what happens is if this is the brain there is unilateral atrophy and complete gyriform calcification so when we do a lateral x-ray it is projected like this all right so you unilateral cerebral atrophy with gyriform calcification is the feature which gives rise to this tram track skull appearance if i ask you where do we see the tram track appearance in the optic nerve in which optic nerve tumor do we see the tram track appearance the answer will be optic nerve meningioma all right so remember in contrast to glioma in contrast to optic nerve glioma which gives rise to a fusiform thickening of the nerve in optic nerve meningioma we will see this tram track appearance where the optic nerve will be seen separately and there will be a tumor around the optic nerve that may or may not show calcification all right so this is where we see tram track appearance the second thing apart from that in ankylosing spondylitis in ankylosing spondylitis spine x-ray we will see the calcification of the interspinous ligament and we will see the fusion of the anterior and uh, of the vertebral bodies basically anterior posterior and right and left so this gives rise to the tram track appearance in ankylosing spondylitis so three things sturge weber optic nerve meningioma ankylosing spondylitis is where we see the tram track appearances in uh, radiology all right apart from that let's look at the next pathology so what do we see here what do you guys think is the finding here is it more white is it more black is it lytic lesion or sclerotic lesion so here what we have are these multiple white white spots which are confluent with each other so these multifocal white spots are nothing but your cotton wool skull appearance what right, i these are referred to as cotton wool spots or your cotton wool skull appearance associated with paget's disease all right so paget's disease again a metabolic bone disease seen in elderly where what we have are three phases correct there is the sclerotic phase lytic phase and a mixed phase so what will this phase correspond to this phase corresponds to the sclerotic phase as it's very obvious all right we see multiple white spots which mean it is the part of the sclerotic phase all right so this is the paget's disease now talking on the same lines when we see the lytic phase of the disease when we see the lytic phase of paget's disease what i will see is this can you see this very very large uh, circumscribed lesion which is lysed this has been referred to as osteoporosis circumscripta this has been referred to as osteoporosis circumscripta so remember the two skull appearances of the same disease paget's disease it can have a sclerotic phase where we see multifocal cotton wool spots it can have a lytic phase where what we can see is this osteoporosis circumscripta all right so remember multifocal such lesions can be associated with paget's disease throughout the body in fact there are multiple signs that you need to know for paget's disease radiologically all right so remember when we do a bone scan in a patient of paget's disease you need to know of two signs again bone scan will show uptake uh in the disease paget's disease multifocal bone uptake can be seen or right depending on the disease status it can show multifocal uptake if there is uptake in the mandible or right if there is uptake in the mandible it looks like abraham lincoln and that is why this has been referred to as the lincoln sign all right if there is uptake in a vertebral body and we take it in an ap projection it kind of looks like the mickey mouse all right it looks like mickey mouse so the uptake in the body and the posterior elements in the transverse processes gives rise to the mickey mouse sign so two signs on bone scan are lincoln sign mickey mouse sign 
all right apart from that there are various other signs uh, various other signs that we can see so in long bones when there is lysis which is happening all right there is lysis which is happening we call it the blade of grass appearance we call it the blade of grass appearance in this sclerotic phase remember when there is the burnt out phase or the sclerotic phase the bones become quite deformed all right the bones will become deformed and they are prone to pathological fractures and once a fracture happens the bone appears bent like a banana all right and this has been referred to as the banana sign here uh, where is the other place where we come across the banana sign we talk about lemon sign and banana sign in kyari too correct so that is again one more place where we see the banana sign two complications of pages disease what are the two complications one is that it poses a risk of osteosarcoma so it can form secondary osteosarcoma the other risk factor is the other complication is because of so much bony uh, processes which are going on there is a lot of demand from the heart which might result in a high output cardiac failure all right so two very very ominous complications we need to know osteosarcoma high output cardiac failure so this is in brief about all the manifestations that we can see with paget's disease remember a disease of the elderly population all right this is something which all of you should know what is this appearance called so this is the heron end or the crew cut appearance so what can we see here we can see that the bony trabeculae is all expanded and is rising up like this so remember this is an appearance which is seen with hemolytic anemia all right so hemolytic anemias when they demand a lot of blood basically when they are lysis uh, lysing a lot of blood the rest of the bones will stand up and say we are going to produce the blood which is called extra medullary hematopoiesis all right so because of this extra medullary hematopoiesis which is going on throughout the bone throughout the body the trabeculae become very very thickened all right and that is the appearance which has been called the heron end or the crew cut appearance all right so this is what is hemolytic anemia in your option you can get thalassemia you can get sickle cell anemia all right so any of the hemolytic anemias can produce this particular appearance a favorite of your examiner so this image is something you need to remember and again it's a very very stark image not something that you can easily forget all right so this is hair on end appearance now what if there is just a focal hair on end that you are seeing do you see this that the entire bone is not involved there is a swelling there is a lesion here that you are seeing which is producing a focal hair on end kind of an appearance remember this is an appearance that is produced by intra osseous hemangioma of the skull hemangioma again a tumor very very commonly seen in the bone in the spine correct this is most commonly seen in spine if it is seen in the bony calvarium or right, if it is seen in the skull we can see that it will produce this focal swelling this focal heronite appearance which is typical for intra osseous hemangiomas all right very very important fine let's look at the next one so what do we see here can you tell me which bone is this what is the bone that houses the pituitary sitting right here yes so this is the cella torsica can i say that the cella torsica is very very wide here so remember here the cella torsica is very large all right and this can produce how this can be produced if there is a pituitary adenoma all right if the pituitary itself is enlarged it will cause the bony remodeling and cella torsica to get enlarged this is a very important feature and the other clues that we can see here is this prognathism that we are seeing this increase in size of the sinuses or right, this increase in size of the maxillary sinus frontal sinus these are all features which point towards acromegaly or right, these point towards acromegaly that there is a growth hormone producing adenoma most likely which is causing the widening of the cella torsica can also be called as the ballooning of the cella torsica and these bony changes of increased uh, calvarial thickness can also be seen although not seen here but increased bony calvarial thickness increase in size of the frontal maxillary sinus as well as prognathism all right so these are all features which are associated with acromegaly 
and whenever we're talking about acromegaly two more important things we need to know will be what we are measuring here so what we are measuring the first thing that i'm showing you is the increased heel pad thickness so remember what happens in acromegaly is because of increased growth hormone there will be increased proliferation of all the soft tissues all right so all the soft tissue increases in thickness like the heel pad again the bony calvarium also increases in thickness so that is also something that we see and again what do we see here we see that there is bony proliferation of the phalanx here and it looks like a spade so remember this spade phalanx sign again a feature of acromegaly all right so three things a ballooning of the cella turcica with skull changes that i mentioned heel pad thickness getting increased and the phalanges are uh, proliferating like a spade so this is the spade phalanx and these are all features that we can see with acromegaly all right let's look at the next uh, skull appearance so what do we see here this is again uh, the x-ray of a child you can make it out by looking at the teeth of the child all right so what we see is there are these multiple lacunae that we are seeing what is this skull appearance called quickly type in your answers what is this skull appearance again a very very favorite of your examiners so yes this is the copper beaten or the silver beaten skull appearance and this is seen in patients who have a raised intracranial pressure remember very very important this is a late sign of raised intracranial pressure where you will have these lacunae these impressions of the brain which are seen on the skull bone which are quite soft in a child so that is why these skull appearances these impressions that you see of the brain basically are uh, produces this copper beaten skull appearance just remember the earliest sign of raised icp in children will be the sutural diastasis if the sutures have not yet fused they will get diastasis uh, the first all right before producing the copper beaten skull which is quite a late sign the earliest feature will be the sutural diastasis all right so this is just one important one liner that can be asked to you all right now let's look at the next one what is this that we are seeing so again can you appreciate that this suture that we had here is getting diastasis all right can you see that there is widening there's diastasis of the suture but not just that can you see that there is a periosteal reaction like a hair on end so can you see this peculated hair on end reaction along with sutural diastasis very very important in a child we always have to consider neuroblastoma skeletal metastasis when i look at such an appearance very very important so when there is focal sutural diastasis with this hair on end periosteal reaction we have to think of neuroblastoma which has a very high tendency to produce bony metastasis remember all right so skeletal metastasis to the skull when they go near the suture they will produce this diastasis with focal periosteal uh, reaction all right so very important neuroblastoma skeletal metastasis would be our very first differential in such a patient okay what are we seeing here what are we seeing here again the skull of a baby we can see here that the anterior fontanelle is not yet fused correct this is the anterior fontanelle being seen on the x ray and what we see here guys what we see here is this j shaped cella can you make out this j so this is the j shaped cella and what are the differentials what are the differentials for j shaped cella so we can quickly remember this mnemonic which is called conman which is called conman so c stands for chronic hydrocephalus so again raised intracranial pressure chronic hydrocephalus can produce this depression of the cella which is chronic hcp the other differential will be the widening all right if there is this optic chiasma which produces a tumor or right, it produces a large tumor can enlarge the cella to produce a j shaped cella so the second differential would be optic chiasma glioma also can be associated with nf1 so that is nf1 
and the other differential can be osteogenesis imperfecta. So three important dysplasias that we need to remember, bony dysplasia seen in children, osteogenesis imperfecta which will have diffusely reduced bone density. So this will be the first differential. Then very very important, the most important, the most frequently asked differential will be MPS, mucopolysaccharidosis. Alright, again a bony dysplasia, a congenital disorder, inborn error of metabolism. Then the next bony dysplasia will be achondroplasia. So the most important ones that we need to remember will be MPS and achondroplasia. And very rarely in 5% adults it can be a normal variant. Without any of these pathologies it can just present as a normal variant. So this is the J-shaped cella that we have uh, studied. Alright, so this is the J-shaped cella. I will just erase this and show you. So this is how it will appear alright so this will have this long beak like thing and this will be the J alright so this is the J shaped cella. So these are all the appearances that we had to study today very very quickly we will just run through all of them and see quickly revise uh, what all we have studied today. So the first thing the most important thing that we need to know is the salt and pepper skull all right is the salt and pepper skull uh, is the sorry the raindrop skull or the punched out lytic lesions where we see multiple large lytic lesions all right where we see multiple large lytic lesions associated with multiple myeloma and lytic metastasis all right the next thing when they are very very tiny non discernible white and black spots this gives rise to the salt and pepper skull associated with the trabecular bony resorption seen with hyperparathyroidism all right then we saw the differences between primary and secondary hpt the hallmark of hpt which is the subperiosteal resorption of the phalanges more on the radial side then we saw the appearances rugger jersey spine associated with secondary hpt and chondrocalcinosis more common with primary hpt Alright, then the other appearance in a child when we see this bewelled lytic lesion or a geographic lytic lesion associated with eosinophilic granuloma or LCH. Then we can have this tram track appearance associated with neurocutaneous syndrome, Sturge Weber syndrome. The child will also have a nevus phlemius or a port wine stain, most commonly in the distribution of the first trigeminal nerve. Alright. Apart from that, we can see these white white woolly spots which are called the cotton wool appearance seen with the sclerotic phase of Paget's disease. A lytic phase of Paget's disease will produce this appearance which is called osteoporosis circumscripta and we saw multiple signs associated with Paget's disease. This is the hair on end or the crew cut appearance seen with hemolytic anemias. If there is a focal such appearance in the skull associated with intraosseous hemangiomas and the next one where we have the ballooning or enlargement of the cella prognathism along with heel pad thickness getting increased and your spade phalanx we think of acromegaly or a GH producing adenoma. Then here we have the silver beetle or the copper beetle appearance associated with raised intracranial pressure. And if there is sutural diastasis with this periosteal thickening and periosteal getting raised like this, we have to think of skeletal metastasis from neuroblastoma. And the finally, the last thing that we saw very very important is the J-shaped cella. Is this elongated cella which is the J-shaped cella. So that's it. These are all the differentials for J-shaped cella. That's all about the various pathological skulls that we had to uh, know about. I hope this was useful to you all and uh, please keep revising these appearances and it will get much easier. Thank you.